Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this virtual meeting of the DNC Credentials Committee. I am John Curry, and I serve as chair of the Credentials Committee. We appreciate you taking the time to join us today. I hope that you all are doing well and staying safe and healthy. We're looking forward to the time when we can conduct these meetings in person again, which we hope will be soon. In the meantime, we appreciate your participation today and all that you do to make sure our party continues to function during this unprecedented times. As a reminder, because this is an official meeting of the committee, we are live screening these uh, proceedings on the DNC YouTube channel. We, we can have an official record of these deliberations. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next item of business, I would ask uh, Ms. Patrice Tuttle to call the roll of the credentials committee members. Good afternoon, Chairman, and good afternoon to all the committee members. Um, I will now begin and call the roll. Uh, uh, Chair Curry. Present. Ms. Biafor. Mr. Bolin? Present. Ms. Estrada? Ms. Estrada has given her proxy to Chair Curry, and I now see that um, Ms. Biafor is present. Ms. Framer? Present. Mr. Fry has given his proxy to Mr. Boland. Mr. Heredia? Present. Present. Mr. Mr. Jacobs, thank you. Present. Mr. Cap. I'm here. Thank you. Ms. Leon Hong? Ms. Leon Hong? I am here. Thank you. Ms. Lucas? Great, I see you. I'm here, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Martinez? I'm here. Thank you. Ms. Velasco? Present. Thank you. Mr. Ortiz? A present. Thank you. Ms. Pensky? Present. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wade? Present. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wabi? Present. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Ward? Present. Thank you. And I will note that Ms. Ward has assigned her proxy to Mr. Martinez in the event that she has to leave before we're done. Mr. Chairman, thank you. You have um, um, a quorum. Okay. Uh, well, we need a quorum of at least 40%. We have 18 members. So eight means uh, that we have a quorum either by person or by proxy. So we have a quorum so we can continue. In addition to our credentials members on the line, we are joined by members of our staff, our DNC Council, Graham Wilson, Andre Torres Levine, and our parliamentarian, Ms. Helen McFadden, who I am pleased to report 
that she's here in New Jersey with me today, and I'm honored to have her to make sure that these meetings run smoothly. So over the, with our overview, let's get started before today's business. The only item on the, on the business of today is considered of a challenge to the credentials of our DNC from members from West Virginia. The challenge was filed by Ms. Victor's on behalf of herself and seven West Virginia Democrats. The challenge alleged that the West Virginia Democratic Party violated several provisions of their state party bylaws and our national charter and bylaws, specifically that they failed to properly notify the meeting uh, where the DNC members were elected, that the party committee was not equally divided, and that the party did not implement appropriate affirmative action and outreach programs and was not specifically diverse. In their papers, the challenge have raised judicial issues about their uh, challenges was properly filed and whether the challenge is precluded by an agreement uh, entered into by Ms. Bickert and the state party, the co-chair of the Rules and Bylaws Committee. On June uh, 9th, committee members receive a meeting reminder for the staff with links of a Dropbox folder with all of the materials and briefs related to the challenge. Our committee rules of procedures set for the process for how we are considering the challenge. The committee rules to receive were provided in the meeting notice email and is also the Dropbox folder. I would like to ask uh, our counsel, Andrea Torres, to provide an overview of the hearing uh, process as provided in the rules. Andrea. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Parties and members of the committee, the DNC bylaws vest this committee with the authority to determine the validity of the credentials of those elected to the DNC. When deciding any challenge, the committee must provide each party a reasonable opportunity to be heard and must give an opportunity for submission of briefs and oral argument. The Credential Committee's rules of procedure were adopted by this committee at a prior meeting during this term and therefore continue to govern the conduct of committee business. The rules provide that they should be interpreted so as to promote the fair, expedient, and efficient conduct of the committee. Under these rules, after consideration of a challenge by the state party and an appeal of the state party's decision, the chair may schedule an open and public hearing on the specific factual and legal matters in dispute. The hearing may be conducted by a hearing officer or by the committee itself. When hearings are conducted by the committee, as it will be here, the chair and the committee assume all authority granted to the hearing officer by the committee's rules. As such, this committee has all powers necessary to conduct the hearing in such a manner so as to secure the just, speedy, and inexpensive determination of the challenge. Additionally, the chair may take any action as may be necessary to carry out the committee's rules or to facilitate the effective operation of the committee. The committee has the authority to receive all competent evidence relative to the specific matters at issue and to assign the appropriate weight to such evidence. As such, the chair has provided the parties with an opportunity to submit written briefs and documentary evidence to this committee for its consideration, which were distributed to each member last week. The chair has also informed the parties that they have been allotted 30 minutes each to present oral testimony and argument for the committee's consideration. The chair has not narrowed the issues that may be raised during these presentations. However, since only members of the committee may propose motions, the committee will not grant or deny dispositive procedural requests during the party's presentations. Rather, if either party requests committee action that could dispose of the challenge or substantively affect the results of the challenge, such actions will only be debated if the motion is made by a member of the committee after both presentations have been completed. After the parties have made their presentations, the committee may engage in up to 30 minutes of debate on the challenge, during which time members may address questions to either party's representatives or the chair as needed. Following debate, the chair will recognize a committee member for the purpose of offering a resolution disposing of the challenge, which may be debated for up to 20 minutes, split evenly between proponents and opponents. At the conclusion of the debate, the resolution will be put to a vote. A majority vote is required to adopt a resolution disposing of the challenge. 
In the event the resolution is not adopted, the chair will continue to recognize members for the purpose of offering resolutions disposing of the challenge until the challenge is disposed of. Thank you in advance for your work today. Okay. As a reminder, the credentials, committee members, and other speakers today will automatically be muted throughout the meeting unless they are recognized to speak. At that point, they will be introduced and unmuted by the staff. After the presentation, we will move to debate during which time credential committee members may ask questions of the party and witnesses and may also discuss any issues that rises this challenge among themselves. If the credentials committee members would like to be recognized for comment or questions, please use the raise, uh, the raise your hand feature at the bottom of the Zoom. That will help you. The staff assistants create the queue that we'll use to call on the members. When, when it's your turn to speak, you will be announced and unmuted. We will do our best to call on everyone in the order you're seeking recognition, but please be patient with us. Are there any questions? If you have any questions, please submit your questions to Liz in the chat room, and we will address them from the group. This is my fortune, Carol. Okay. No questions. Okay, now we can go to them. It seems that there are no questions. I would like to discuss recuse of members who are uh, from the impact state under Article 2, Section 4C of the DNC bylaws. No challenge. DNC member is entitled to vote on a challenge to their credentials. In line with the provisions of our past practice, uh, Chair Befford from West Virginia has recused herself from the final action of this body. Based on your past participation, she is submitted, uh, permitted to participate in any discussion, but when taking a vote on how resolution resolving the challenge, she will not vote. If there are no objections, that is how we will uh, proceed. No objections. All right, good. Okay, introducing the challenge party. Uh, I introduce uh, uh, Ms. Bickert. We will how be considered of the West Virginia challenge. At this time, I will acknowledge Ms. Bickert, Bickert, the representative of the challenge party, to begin her presentation. As a reminder, both the challenge party and the challenge uh, party has been located, uh, allocated 30 minutes to present evidence and oral argument in front of the credentials committee. Under, under our rules, each side may call uh, as many witnesses as they deem appropriate. Credential committee members, there will be time to, for questions, so hold the questions until the presentation from the challenge or the challenge of parties is completed. Ms. Victor, you may begin your presentation. Chairman and members of this committee, I'm Selena Vickers, a registered Democrat and a proud and lifelong resident of West Virginia. We are challenging the DNC credentials of the four DNC members from West Virginia. The elections of these four party officials involved gross violations of certain key provisions of the West Virginia bylaws and key provisions and policies of the National Party Charter and DNC bylaws. <clears throat> there are several 
procedural issues that I want to address initially. I request that this committee dismiss the answer of the challenge parties because it was filed with the Credentials Committee 10 days after the cutoff date of January 15th. Slide, please. The September 11, 2020 scheduling letter from the co-chairs of the Credentials Committee, if you could post the slide, there you go. Um, the deadline for the challenged parties to file an answer was January 15th, 2021. Chair BF4, representing the parties, did not slide. Oh, no, no, you got it right there. That's good. Uh, did not sign the answer until January 22nd, 2021, which was seven days after the deadline. Slide. By her certificate of service, VIA4 states that she served the answer on January 22nd by registered mail. However, you'll see by the postmark that VIA4 did not mail the answer until 10 days after the last date for, that was allowed for filing its service. Slide. The postmark, which determines the date of filing, is January 25th, uh, 10 days after the, the deadline. BF4's certificate of service is not only wrong, it's misleading. BF4 did not ask for an extension of time to file and serve the answer. Therefore, I request that this committee dismiss her answer with prejudice. Also, the challenged parties have claimed that our challenge was not properly filed. I filed our challenge by email one day early. Rule 6B1 of the Rules of Procedure of this committee provide that documents in connection with challenges are to be filed by registered mail or by hand or overnight delivery. However, we were at the height of COVID last summer. Due to the dangers of COVID-19, including a stay-at-home order that was in effect in West Virginia and D.C., the Rules and Bylaws Committee and the Credentials Committee of the National Convention authorized such filing of those documents by email rather than registered mail. Slide. Patrice Taylor of the uh, Democrat of the DNC Party Affairs sent an email to Harold Ickes dated July 9th, 2020, responding to his question about filing by mail. And she responded, as you can see in red, the co-chairs have confirmed that they will permit electronic email submissions. I request that this committee find that our challenge was properly filed, reject the motion of the challenge parties to, to dismiss our challenge and proceed with this hearing. Additionally, the challenge parties argue that our withdrawal of prior challenges without prejudice prevents us from filing this challenge. The position of the challenge parties is wrong and has no basis. Earlier in 2020, we had filed several challenges against BA4 and the Executive Committee for actions which violated the state law and, and uh, party rules. A number of those challenges also included issues about lack of affirmative action, lack of an affirmative action committee, no affirmative action outreach, and that the fact that the Executive Committee was not diverse, was virtually all white, and lack of adequate and effective notice. The last challenge that we filed was July 14th to the Credentials Committee of the Democratic National Convention, which was coming up in 2020. Those challenges were scheduled to be heard and decided by the Standing Committee on Credentials to the National Convention, not by this committee. In the latter part of July 2020, top officials of the DNC asked me if we would withdraw our pending challenges in return for agreeing to some bylaw changes because it, the, the contents of those challenges were embarrassing to the DNC. Given the potential controversy of some of those challenges that it would raise at the convention and that might detract from the messaging of the convention, uh, we agreed to withdraw those challenges. And we entered, uh, well, we agreed to enter into a memorandum of understanding, MOU, which was drafted by DNC lawyers and which was signed by BF4, myself, and uh, chair, co chairs Roosevelt Miller with the uh, Rules of Ballots Committee. After signing the MOU, I immediately withdrew the pending challenges. On July 29th, 
I and seven other reform Democrats filed this challenge before you today. The argument of the challenged parties that the withdrawal of the pending challenges prevented the filing of this current challenge is, with, is without basis. First, they are different claims. There's a different committee. There are different rules and different relief sought. Secondly, before signing the MOU, there were no discussions that the withdrawal of the pending challenges would prevent filing of completely different challenges, such as the one before you today. Third, there is nothing in the MOU which provides that the withdrawal of the pending challenges was with prejudice, meaning that the pending challenges could not be refiled. Fourth, there is there was nothing in the MOU which provided that withdrawal of the pending challenges would prevent us from filing subsequent and different challenges. Fifth, B4 got what she asked for, what she wanted, which was the withdrawal of the pending challenges. Six, if one of the conditions of signing the MOU had been that I and others would not be able to file challenges, I would not have entered the MOU. And lastly, the DNC achieved what they wanted, and which was to not have any credentials um, brought up, challenges brought up before the national convention. The position of the challenged parties is without any basis or merit, and therefore it must be dismissed. Lastly, or now, I wanna to turn to the key issues in our challenge. First is the issue of notice. The second being lack of any affirmative action outreach, uh, to historically underrepresented groups. And third is the unacceptable lack of diversity of the membership of the executive committee as of June 29th, 2020. Turning first to notice, one of the fundamental elements of our party rules is to ensure that all those that wish to participate in democratic party affairs have the opportunity to do so. The element the key element to achieving this goal is effective notice, not just to party insiders, but to all those who wish to, to, to participate in a Democratic Party affairs. Without effective notice, participation cannot be achieved. The so-called notice provided by the executive committee in connection with the important elections of June 29th cannot by any stretch of the imagination be considered effective notice. Following the and slide, please. Following the 1964 convention, where Fannie Lou Hamer and the Mississippi Freedom Delegation pleaded for participation in the Democratic Party, the Special Equal Rights Committee was appointed, and which provides in there the requirement of the six uh, of the. Uh, I'm sorry, the requirement that each state undertakes to assure that voters will have the opportunity to participate fully in party affairs slide. And later, the Mikulski Commission required that state party add six basic element, uh, the six basic elements to the state party rules slide. So here the arrows show the importance, it has the open party. The second arrow shows the listing of the six basic elements to an open party slide. And it has this highlighted part in there, slide, that I wanna to read to you. To supplement the requirements of the 64 and 68 convention, the commission requires that state parties include the six basic elements of the special rights committee to their party rules and take appropriate steps to secure their implementation. In those, those six elements were adopted by the DNC on January 8, 1968. Elements five and six state, the Democratic Party in each state should publicize fully in such a manner as to ensure notice to all interested parties, a full description of the legal and practical procedures for the selection of Democratic Party officers and representatives at all levels. And publications of these procedures should be done in a fashion that all prospective and current members of each state Democratic Party be fully and adequately informed of the pertinent procedures 
and time to participate in each selection procedure at all levels. None of the notice, notice that provided by, by BF4 and the executive committee came close to meeting the standards of effective notice. I'm gonna skip over a couple of slides. Uh, slide, 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 slide. BF4 ran one, one paid ad, which you would need a magnifying glass to see. It was in the legal advertisement section. It ran for one day on June 24th in the Charleston Gazette Mail. And that was five days before the executive committee meeting, the organizational meeting where um, these officers were elected. This was the only public notice, the only public notice provided to, uh, to the public, to activists, to Democrats in general, outside of the, the membership of the executive committee. This is the only thing pushed out. There were a couple notices that we'll talk about that were just posted on the website. But let's look at this. Like the, I want you to really look at this notice and see if you think that this is adequate notice. The only thing on there on the agenda, it says update on convention, which had been uh, a few days before, election of officers and announcements. That's it. If that's all the information provided to the public and to Democrats in general, hardly less information could have been provided. It doesn't even provide how, where, where to attend. And that particular meeting was by Zoom. There wasn't a Zoom link provided. There was, so if you happen to, to fall upon this ad hidden back in the legal section, five days before this meeting, and you were interested in participating and in running for a party position, how would you go about doing that? How in the world would anyone other than a party insider be able to learn that elections were to take place and what offices were to be elected and the processes and procedures involved? This notice cannot be called adequate and effective notice. The challenge parties may also refer to other notices slide posted on the party's website, but these were not pushed out to the public and they did not contain any more information in them than, the, than what was in that legal advertisement except for a link, no information no information about the offices to be elected, how to participate, any of that. According to the affidavit of communications director, Brittany McGuire on June 20th, she stated that a notice of the 20, June 29 meeting was sent to some 30,000 West Virginia Democrats that were on the party's listserv through NGP van. She states that the listserv contains county committee members, delegates to the state convention, can and uh, candidates, among other people. Slide. This is exhibit eight and nine, which she said was sent to the 30,000 uh, people on the listserv. Um, next will be um, there will be witnesses, there will be recorded statements, but they are in the meeting and we'll be glad to answer any questions. Um, slide. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. And here is the actual, this is from the answer uh, 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 that BF4 sent in stating that the notice was sent to 30,000 West Virginia Democrats on June 20th. Slide. This is the email sent to just the executive committee members. Again, no additional information. Slide. This was attached in that email. Again, no additional information. Election of officers was all the information. Next. I'm Jeanette Bizarre. I'm one of the challengers, and I'm also one of the state leaders of the West Virginia Poor People's Campaign. I searched the June 2020 emails, and those from the West Virginia Democratic Party are primarily of a fundraising nature. 
I did not receive an email announcing the June 29th, 2020 meeting for officers were elected. If there had been adequate notice to this meeting, I would have recruited people of color and poor people who desperately need representation in our state party to run for these uh, positions. Go ahead and play the next couple slides, please, of the witnesses. Uh, my name is Deirdre Purdy. I am a registered Democrat in West Virginia, and I have been a registered Democrat for uh, 55 years. I'm also the chairperson of the Calhoun County Executive Committee. I regularly receive emails from the West Virginia State Democratic Party either from Belinda Biafor or from the people in charge of communications. I have searched my email for the dates from June 16th to June 29th, 2020. And although I received emails for fundraising from the State Democratic Party, I did not receive any emails on June 20th. And in particular, I never received an email announcing an organizational, me organizational meeting to elect party officers. I never received any notice of state party business by the United States mail. Hi, my name is Brittany Barlett. I am a registered Democrat in the state of West Virginia. I was an electorate to the state 2021 convention. Uh, I ran for office for House of Delegates in the 46th district in 2020. I'm a member of the local Democratic Women's Group in Lewis County and also was a previous member of the Young Democrats in Lewis County. I have searched my email from June 16th through June 29th in 2020. I'm actually subscribed to the State Democratic Party through two emails. I regularly receive fundraising emails, but receive nothing alerting me to the June 29th uh, state executive meeting. Uh, I did, however, receive emails on June 16th and June 23rd regarding how to elect and the actual election of state delegates to the state convention. I did not receive notice of the Democratic Executive Committee meeting by any other communicational means. Uh, my name is Lissa Lucas. I'm a registered Democrat in West Virginia. I've been active in Democratic politics for many years. For this last campaign cycle, I served as communications director for a Democratic gubernatorial campaign and then a Democratic U.S. Senate campaign. I have in total about 17 years of communications experience. Uh, in that time, I've utilized a variety of different mass email programs, including, of course, NGP Van. I would be genuinely shocked if, in response to making a formal request for proof that an important email had been sent, if a direct report of mine instead sent me copy-pasted email contents without even intact headers showing a subject line, date, and time. Uh, detailed email reports might dig deep, but just showing proof that an email was sent and when and to whom is Roughly a 10 second, very easy operation consisting of navigating to the uh, campaign emails page and pulling up the correct email. That would show the date the email was sent to whom, what percentage of people opened the mail and what percentage clicked through on links and so forth. Uh, any comms professional would know how to do this and anyone supervising an outreach program should know enough to realize that a screenshot of contents especially without even headers, does not show that an email was sent. Thank you. Um, so the last one was obviously from a communications director with 17 years experience, uh, just stating how it would be a 10 second uh, procedure to uh, provide proof that 30,000 emails were sent that has not been, has been asked for and has not been provided by the state party. And I want to remind you that uh, the bylaws state in Article 2, Section 11, C, Triple 3, uh, th Triple I, if challenged, a state party shall be deemed to be in compliance upon proof of effective notice from the reporting part uh, of the party. The 
Challenge parties will also point to a so-called press release dated June 20, 2020, uh, posted, that is posted on uh, the party's website. The challenge, um, other than Brittany McGuire's affidavit, there is no evidence that this press release was in fact sent out. Uh, I personally called um, four, well, several of, but, I, but four of the press organizations referred to in the affidavit had access to the inbox uh, for their press releases. They checked that inbox and saw that they did have emails from the party around June 20th on separate issues, but no one, not one, had a notice from the party pertaining to the June 29 meeting. The contents of the so-called notice contained as little information as possible. Um, it did not include information about what offices would be elected and the process involved. The party notices did not comply with the standards required by party rules. There's no evidence of the 30,000 emails being sent. And even if, even if the 30,000 emails had been sent with the contents of that notice, that notice was still deficient and did not come close to constituting effective notice. And no evidence, there's no evidence that the press release was sent out to the press organization. And I want to specifically remind you that at no point at all was there ever any communication about the election of the committee man and woman who are not officers. Next, I'd like to draw your um, attention to affirmative, lack of affirmative action. In the slide that uh, you see before you, the party charter, which was first adopted in 1974, requires that state parties shall adopt and implement an affirmative action program, which provides for representation as nearly as practicable of the aforementioned groups as indicated by their presence in a democratic electorate. And also that this program shall include specific goals and timetables to achieve this purpose. Until March the 15th of 2021, a couple months ago, the executive committee had never adopted anything even close to an affirmative action plan applicable to the state party and still hasn't, but they at least put it in their bylaws um, that they would. There's some confusion about what happened on June 3rd, but um, BFOR, Chair BFOR refers to affirmative action plans, which are part of delegate selection plans. Um, and But these affirmative action plans expire on the convening of the national convention. Slide, please. On June 2nd, um, co-chairs Roosevelt and Miller of the Rosenbalos Committee, in response to an allegation that the state party did not have an affirmative action plan or program, wrote a letter to myself and asked Chair Biafor um, uh, told her about the allegation of lack of affirmative action plan or program and asked the state party uh, to provide proof of such if they had it. She was given until June 18th to uh, respond to that allegation. Um, slide, please. This is an email um, in response, Chair Biafor sent this email to the DNC and myself on June 19th um, that said, please please find the answer to the challenge from Selena Vickers concerning the West Virginia Democratic Party not having an affirmative action plan. We have always maintained caucuses for our group and attached was the plan. Slide. Inside that plan, it stated in yellow that the co-chairs uh, of the affirmative action committee shall be elected by the state committee at the organizational meeting. Slide. It also... Um, did not provide any representative goals at all. Every one of them was blank, and there were no timetables identified. Slide. It also said that the Affirmative Action Committee would recommend one male and one female uh, to be voted on by the Executive Committee as at-large members of the Executive Committee. This plan that was provided on June 19th was literally 10 days before the organizational meeting where these officers were elected. None of the things in that plan occurred. There was no election of AA committee um, 
co-chairs. There was no nomination of at-large members by an affirmative action committee. If that affirmative action committee a plan was a real plan, that those things would have happened literally 10 days later. Um, the next is a uh, Walt Oval, and he is a 20-year member of the state executive committee uh, discussing that meeting slide or we'll play the witness. Uh, hello, my name is Walt Oval, and I'm pleased to appear before the Democratic National Committee Credentials Committee uh, regarding the June 2020 organizational meeting of West Virginia State Democratic Executive Committee. Um, I'm aware that a challenge has been made to certain aspects of uh, procedure and practice of the executive committee arising from that meeting, and particularly focused on the existence or non-existence of the firm of action plan. Uh, I can address that there was no firm of action plan presented to the executive committee uh, either then or at any point before then. Uh, none has ever been adopted by the State Democratic Executive Committee until uh, a recent memorandum of understanding was entered into by the uh, State Party and uh, others uh, just this year. So uh, I'm aware that there was a representation that the state had an affirmative action plan and it was in place in June of 2020. If there was such a plan, I, as a member of the committee for approximately 20 years, had never heard of it and knew nothing about it. Uh, I have reviewed the plan that was presented to the DNC as uh, the plan that was uh, the state plan and note that the actions which were required under that plan to be taken at the organizational meeting regarding the election of co-chairs to the Affirmative Action Committee uh, and that there would be nomination of two at-large members from the Affirmative Action Committee to the Executive Committee, neither of those happened. And, and haven't happened until just this year. So that did not occur as the affirmative action plan that was submitted indicates should have happened. Um, so uh, I was present at the meeting. I've been present at, I believe, all of the executive committee meetings uh, since then uh, and would note that none of those things have happened. Uh, there has never been until uh, just this last this month, uh, any affirmative action plan uh, that has been in place to increase diversity in the executive committee uh, that, that apparently should have been done and for reasons that are beyond the scope of this area, uh, it has not been done. Uh, and I'm happy to answer questions uh, and happy to answer anything that the committee may have. The composition of the membership of the executive committee on June the 26th did not include any members from some of the underrepresented groups. For instance, um, on June 29th, there, the executive committee did not have one, not even one single voting black member. And based on voters participation in the democratic electorate, there should have been five. Because the diversity of the membership of the executive committee did not comply with the requirements of the charter and the party rules, it was not legally constitu constituted to elect the members of the DNC. There are witnesses, um, additional witnesses to not receiving the, uh, the emails that are on and the other people who um, gave witness are available to answer any questions. Specifically, uh, Matthew Kerner, who is the Upshur County Democratic Party Chair, um, and several other people who have been Democrats, um, uh, delegates to the uh, state convention, and even delegates to the national convention. Additionally, Harold Ickes uh, is on uh, and could answer any questions related to specific rules and bylaws. With that said, I want to uh, thank you all for your time um, and consideration of this. Um, I can tell you, regardless of what happens here today, we have already won. Um, I've had um, a number of, uh, I call them kids, calling up asking how to participate in the party. And three counties have called for the resignation of uh, Chair Bia Four just in the last week. Brought it to a close. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Vickert. Uh, time has concluded. 
uh, of the challenge presentation. I would now uh, recognize West Virginia State the Democratic Chairwoman uh, Belinda Belfort to begin our presentation. Chairwoman. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of this wonderful committee. I'm Belinda Beafor, the chair of the West Virginia State Party. And I also have with me our DNC committee man, Pat Maroney and committee woman, Elaine Harris. So at this time, if Elaine Harris would um, be brought into the room, please. Go ahead, Elaine. Oh, good afternoon, uh, members of the committee uh, and Mr. Chairman. Um, it is a pleasure to um, be before you today. And uh, just to give you uh, some uh, uh, brief background of my um, association <clears throat> work with the Democrat Party. I am a very proud member of the Communications Workers of America, and I currently serve as the um, staff as a staff representative here in West Virginia and have uh, been in that position for 26 uh, years. But prior to that, I started uh, my uh, work in telecommunications in the private sector and uh, was a local officer. And um, in, in that time, um, I my work with uh, the uh, political arena, with the Democrat Party on a local level, um, I had uh, great mentors like Larry Cohen, uh, my uh, former international president, um, who always, um, he would tell me when I was, he believed I was right, and he would tell me when I was wrong. Uh, but um, he uh, showed me the ways of getting involved. And, um, and, and our membership throughout the country is involved in many aspects. And we see this as a partnership to work with uh, the Democrat Party at the different levels. And it's, it's a partnership to where we don't sit on the sidelines. We come, we get involved. And um, so I um, uh, am anxious um, to see things uh, to uh, uh, start to take a turn here in West Virginia as far as, as our elections. Um, you know, that's just, uh, I, you know, I cannot tell you enough of the work that we, in a pandemic, the work that we were able to do uh, and, um, and we will continue to do more. Um, I uh, have been honored to serve also with another mentor, um, Pat Maroney. Uh, when I became the National Committee woman, I was first appointed and then elected. Um, I uh, had uh, Pat to show me the ways. And uh, in doing that, um, uh, we were able to work through uh, what we were able to accomplish with the DNC, a labor council. I am a member of that steering committee of the formed labor council, and um, we have been welcomed and, and been a full participant within uh, the national party. And I have tried to share that information with uh, the, the things that we work on a, a national basis with uh, others. So um, it is indeed a pleasure to uh, come before you today uh, to uh, uh, share with you what I believe is some of the contributions that myself and others have made uh, through labor and our partnership uh, with the Democrat Party. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elaine. Now, Mr. Pat Maroney. You're here today, and I, I served since 1972 as general counsel to the West Virginia AFL-CIO and have participated probably with every local union in West Virginia <clears throat> in various types of activities. Uh, uh, some I've represented all the industrial, all the building trades, the service workers, the AFT, the teachers. I don't think there's been an opportunity in, in labor that I haven't had an opportunity to participate in. Uh, part of that has been candidate uh, recruitment and endorsement of Democrats to make sure that we have really first class candidates and electable, electable people. Uh, also, unfortunately, I've also had the opportunity to have to engage in many injunctions which have occurred in West Virginia regarding not only the Democratic Party, but also uh, labor. But yesterday, here in West Virginia, we had a great victory when we took on the Republican governor who had had elected with the Republican legislature to try to deny unions the right to have union checkoffs. We got an injunction prohibiting that 
hopefully we can keep it in place forever and ever. Uh, but uh, uh, we've we've had lots of opportunities here in West Virginia. I come from a proud union family too. My grandfather was a organizer for the UMW of A and the old Knights of Labor. My father, my cousin was the international president of the Amalgamated Transit Union. All of my children, all of my children belong to a labor union, the IBEW, the AFT, the ITASI, uh, the CWA. So we have a strong union family here in West Virginia, but also as part of the Democratic family, uh, I was chair of this party in West Virginia from 1996 to 2003. I was vice chair of the Southern Caucus from 2000 to 2003. I've served on the DNC since 2004. I was Robert Kennedy, part of Robert Kennedy's field activities uh, during the 1968 election until the tragedy struck. Uh, I've been co-chair this time of the Biden-Harris Leadership Committee here in West Virginia to see what we could do to help in that in that regard, and as also the uh, chair of the Biden uh, delegates here in West Virginia. I was Kerry's attorney in West Virginia in 04, the Gore attorney in 00, uh, 00 and I've co-authored the West Virginia v Voter Protection Manual, been the voter protection chair in West Virginia in every election since 2000. And so I've had a huge history with the West Virginia Democratic Party, and I really am anxious to continue that history uh, for another 50 to 60 years, hopefully. <laughs> so thanks very much for having me. Thank you, Pat. Our vice chair couldn't be with us today, but I'll tell you a little bit about Rod Snyder. He's the past president of the Young Dems of America. He is our first openly gay vice chair elected by the West Virginia Democratic Party. He's been a candidate for the West Virginia House of Delegates, concentrating on opportunity through quality education, economic security for working families, health and safe communities, integrity and transparency in government. He had the endorsement of several labor unions during, uh, including, but not limited to, WVEA, American Federation of Teachers, uh, the West Virginia AFL-CIO, the United Mine Workers, Communication Workers, and the Regional Council of Carpenters. Now I'm gonna move on to myself. I've been involved in democratic politics since a young age. I grew up with a single mother raising three children of her own. And at that time, it was apparent to me that when people who work hard may still need a little help to get by. Since the beginning of my involvement, moving my way up from young Democrats to local county committees, to president of the West Virginia Federation of Democratic Women, to vice chair of the party, and now chair of the West Virginia Democratic Party. I have held on to the value that the Democratic Party should fight for the underserved, underrepresented, and the hardworking families that deserve good wages, health care, benefits, and sometimes a little help when they need it. I have worked side by side with our union brothers and sisters, especially here in West Virginia, the UMWA. My union ties are deeply threaded into the work that I continue to do for the workers of this state. When my nieces, Sarah and Ashley came into the world, I knew I wanted to do something better for this party. In all the capacities that I have served, I know that my number one priority was to do better and leave this party better than when I found it. I have served on local committees, volunteered for numerous Democratic campaigns, both nationally and here in West Virginia. And I stand alongside our labor unions. As serving as the president of the Federation and now as chairwoman, I have always been transparent, reachable, and I have never denied anyone involvement in party relations. And I certainly believe and do the work to ensure that everyone has a seat at the table. Since I became chairwoman, we have ran several programs to reach underrepresented communities in West Virginia. Our first year, we conducted a deep canvas into marginalized and underrepresented communities. We worked with county parties to train, recruit groups, and caucuses to help with this effort. Each year since, we have administered programs to ensure representation in the Democratic Party. We had a program called Stand Up Summer, Fight for 55, Adopt a Voter Program, Precinct Captain Outreach Programs, 
our women and youth summits. Under my leadership, I started the very the party's very first women's summit. And we brought in a variety of communities to talk about ways that the Democratic Party could help. I do what I do because I dare care deeply about West Virginia and deeply about the Democratic Party. Is there more to do? Absolutely. It's nonstop and we're at it every day. The West Virginia Democratic Party fights every day to serve and protect working West Virginia families. In West Virginia, we've seen a lot of struggle and our constituency deserves a party that will stand up for them and fight. And that's what we do from holding picket lines with our proud union brothers and sisters, fighting for workplace equality, higher pay, benefits, and safety, and to advocate for affordable, good quality health care, and hold the GOP control of our state accountable when they attack the rights of West Virginia's marginalized communities. Since I took over as chair of the West Virginia Democratic Party, I have made it very clear that I want this party better and more representative of all West Virginians. I made it clear on day one of my chairmanship that this party for too long had not taken a stand for everyone. And I would work every day to ensure that this party moved forward, not only to represent all West Virginians, but fight every day to ensure that it would happen. This is what we're doing now, and this is what we're going to continue to do. Each day is a new challenge and a new attack from the GOP stronghold. We work with our county committees, affiliated organizations, and local activists on a daily basis to go into communities and reach people where they are to fight for the betterment of the Democratic Party and for all West Virginia. The West Virginia Democratic Party serves a state that is rapidly shifting to complete GOP control. A lot of Democrats in West Virginia are still registered Democrats but I have, and have identified for many years, but they've been shifting their support to the Republican candidates, even on local levels or changing their party to an R entirely. Retaining those voters under the large umbrella of the Democratic Party and convincing them to continue to support Democrats up and down the ballot has been a challenge in a state that overwhelmingly voted for President Trump in 2016 and 2020. A lot of the work that we do is identifying how to appeal to those voters who are often stuck on single issue um, problems. To address this, we have started a comprehensive voter outreach program under the title Build Back Blue in order to reach out to voters who feel left behind by the Democratic Party on a national level and to appeal and bring new voters who have not been involved in past elections. In addition, that plan is also heavily focused on reaching underrepresented communities and minority constituencies in order to ensure that the West Virginia Democratic Party is inclusive and representative of all people from all backgrounds. So let's talk about what this challenge is really about. This is a challenge to the unanimous elections of four DNC members. A vote to deny us these credentials would be a vote against the unanimous choices of our party. These challengers raised several complaints about our state party's composition and practices. While there's always room for improvement, and in a few minutes we'll talk about some of those that we've made, the challengers have not even attempted to present evidence that had any aspect that this election been different, the four of us would not have been elected. No one ran against us. Other races on June 29th were contested, ours were not. And not one person has come forward to say they would have run against us, but somehow we prevented them from doing so. If the challengers had wanted representation on the DNC, they could have run themselves or recruited candidates to run against us, but they did not. And, they, and now they are asking you to intervene and overturn an election that they didn't even contest. As far as the memorandum of understanding, I'd like to make a few remarks. As Ms. Vickers stated during her remarks, this is the ninth challenge she has filed against us in two years. She filed a challenge to our practices and procedures at every chance available to her. 
She even filed what might have been the first ever challenge to the chair's selection of convention pages. Despite Ms. Vickers' inflammatory rhetoric, she did raise some helpful points about how our bylaws could be improved. So to ensure that our party was doing all we could do to welcome diverse voices, last summer, we agreed to conduct a comprehensive review of our bylaws to ensure that they adequately reflected our values of transparency, inclusion, and diversity. In exchange, Ms. Vickers agreed to withdraw her pending challenges against us. The co-chairs of the Rules and Bylaws Committee, James Roosevelt and Lorraine Miller, generously agreed to provide RBC supervision and assistance in this process. This agreement was memorialized in a memorandum of understanding, which I, Ms. Vickers, and the co-chairs of the RBC all signed. When I signed the memorandum of understanding, I did not expect it to be the end of the story, but rather the beginning. I understood that to uphold my end of the deal, my party would need to make real efforts to improve our bylaws and ensure that we were implementing programs for a diverse and inclusive West Virginia Democratic Party. We have upheld our end of the bargain. I'm proud of all the accomplishments that we have made since last summer. Ms. Vickers did not uphold her end of the bargain. In our memorandum, we agreed that a comprehensive review and revision of our bylaws rather than a series of challenges was the most productive path forward. But two days after signing an agreement to withdraw her challenges, Ms. Vickers filed another one, this one to you on your committee. This challenge raises the exact same issues as one of the challenges Ms. Vicker had agreed to withdraw two days before. Word for word, it is the same challenge against the same people, although it was based on them being automatic delegates to the convention. I had hoped that this memorandum of understanding and the monumental task ahead of us to grow our party, Ms. Vickers would put aside her desire to oust me and my fellow officers through DNC challenges and instead focus her energies on the task at hand. But instead of proceeding in good faith, and working with the party, she filed this challenge and has escalated her attacks on us. Filing this challenge showed a lack of respect to the agreement that she had just made with me and with the RBC co-chairs, and for all the work that we and the members of the RBC had put in the meantime. Now, we've made progress since then. While, Mick, while Ms. Vickers didn't uphold her end of the bargain, our party has worked diligently to address the issues she raises in her challenge today. With the expert assistance of Leah Darty and Frank Leone as representatives of the RBC, we updated our bylaws to provide for a more robust notice, open meeting provisions, and equal division at every level of our party, neither of which are required by the DNC rules, but which we all agreed were ways to strengthen our party. We've also added new diversity committees and of an affirmative action committee composed of West Virginia Democrats from traditionally underrepresented groups to nominate additional diverse members of the state executive committee. These members will take the lead in updating and implementing the affirmative action plan that's been approved. The plan that we approved two weeks ago was modeled after the affirmative action plan that was passed by South Carolina Democratic Party when Jamie Harrison was chair. Just this week, my colleagues of the Association of State Democratic Chairs, the DNC's organization of the state chairs, vice chairs and executive directors, whose mission is to build strong democratic parties and to elect Democrats at all levels of office, sent a letter of support of our work to organize, conduct outreach and improve the guiding documents of their state party to become more representative and inclusive of all West Virginians. Unfortunately, despite our constant focus, good faith efforts in this progress, we have resulted in improvements in the outreach to the core constituency. Ms. Vickers still finds issues with our efforts based on her individual interpretation of the rules and how they're being implemented. We are committed to moving forward and working towards a shared goal of outreach and engagement. 
The four points that she brings up, I think you need to know a little bit of background on the progress that our party has made over the last year, but I want to also address the substance in Ms. Vicker's complaints. In this challenge, Ms. Vicker raises four complaints about our party and our procedures from last summer when we held a meeting of our state executive committee to elect our party officers pursuant to our bylaws. First, she claims there was inadequate notice of the meeting at which the four of us were elected. That is simply not true. We sent notice by email or mail twice to every member of the executive committee, which is the body that votes in the elections of this issue. We also took out a paid ad in a major statewide newspaper announcing the meeting. We sent several press releases to other major outlets in the state. We added the meeting to our calendar events and the blog on our website. And finally, we emailed a general list of West Virginia Democrats announcing the meeting and election. Our bylaws required notice to members and a press release, and we fully complied with these requirements. The meeting of the West Virginia Democratic Executive Committee held virtually on June 29th was held pursuant to Rule 4D1 of the West Virginia Democratic Party rules and the West Virginia Code Chapter 3, Article 1-9. 2020 <clears throat> Rule 4D1 required five-day notice, and we gave nine, to members of the committee and the public complying with that rule. The June 29th 2020 meeting was fully advertised on June 20th on the online calendar, bulletin board, blog post, press release, statewide press release, paid legal ad. Um, the meeting notices and agendas were mailed to the West Virginia State Executive Committee and sent via U.S. mail to those that requested um, their correspondence be received in that manner. It is undisputed that the challengers and the West Virginians had a sufficient notice because contested elections were held for associate secretary, parliamentarian, and a vice chair's position. In fact, the individuals who won these contested elections added to the diversity of our committee. Secondly, Ms. Vickers claims that our state party was not equally divided between men and women at the time of her election, but her challenge itself acknowledges that it was. Ms. Vicker complaints, complaint is that we had not sent an updated roster of our members to the Secretary of State's office since our last election. Regardless of the paperwork that was filed, the 38 men and the 38 women who voted on June 29th were members of our executive committee and their votes should count. Third, Ms. Vickers claims that our party was not properly constituted because the executive committee had fewer diverse members than their community's presence in the Democratic electorate. Now, I won't deny that our party is less diverse than when we like, but that's why we've worked so hard to amend our bylaws to ensure that our party's diversity and membership continue to grow. While the DNC does not impose membership quotas for state party, in fact, the charter and bylaws are very clear that quotas are not allowed. We are still working to increase our diversity numbers in the party. To invalidate our elections because of the racial composition of our party would in effect be placing membership quotas on our party, something that our bylaws simply do not allow. In fact, quotas are not even allowed for delegate selection a process which the DNC regulates much more strictly. Finally, Ms. Vickers alleges that our party did not have an affirmative action plan. Simply not true. Our party has engaged in numerous outreach programs, including partnerships with black church leaders to mobilize GOT efforts through our Strolls to the Polls initiative, public support for the LGBTQ community, a stand-up voter education and outreach program geared towards women and youth, and off-year programmatic work designed to build robust infrastructure from the ground up. Furthermore, <clears throat> during my tenure as chair, the West Virginia Democratic Party has hired outreach staff as part of a coordinated campaign program to work with youth, African-Americans, women, seniors, veterans. 
Since I became chair in 2015, the state executive committee has become more diverse <clears throat> and representative of West Virginia. <clears throat> in our newly Build Back Blue program, the West Virginia Democratic Party has outlined our goals to hire a director of organizing and outreach, to lead outreach across the state, and assist our affirmative action goals. Our priority is diversity, equality, and inclusion as we continue to build our constituency caucuses to further West Virginia Democratic Party's mission to ensure that our party is welcoming to diverse communities all across our state. Additionally, we have always had an affirmative action plan for our delegate selection process, which has always been approved by the RBC and the benefits of which could be felt throughout our party affairs. By implementing best practices, such as delegate selection toolkits made publicly available, our Democratic Party welcomed new voices into the process. By and large, nearly all of the affirmative action goals for our national convention delegation were met. Furthermore, we have had affirmative action plan as part of the state's delegate selection plan since the DNC began to require them over 40 years ago. So the question before you is a simple one. Will you vote to overturn the results of an uncontested election because a few members of our party are upset about the results? I thank you for your time today. I want you to know that our party has made incredible progress this year to increase transparency, openness, and diversity. And I am confident that we will only continue to improve our diversity as our party's new plan is implemented. We are asking you not to undo the will of our party and to let us continue to rebuild our base, attract new voters, and remind West Virginians that the Democratic Party is for them as we move forward and turn our state blue. Thank you again. I appreciate the time and I'm, we're all open for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairwoman. That Thank you, Chairwoman. That concludes the presentation of the challenged party. Uh, with the conclusion of the presentation, we will open the floor to allow 30 minutes of debate by credential committee members and any questions members have for each party represent our chair. As a reminder of the, of the representative of the party, you are here to answer questions that are directed to you, the committee member. Each side allotted and used the time allocated for all arguments at this time. Committee members are able to discuss the presentation. And if you have any questions, we will let you know when you are able to respond. If the credentials committee would like to be recognized for comment or questions, please use the raised hand feature on Zoom. That will help us, the staff assistant, create a queue that we use to call on each member when it is a term to speak. You will be announced and unmuted. Uh, we, we will do our best to call on everyone in the order you are seeking recognition. Because of the virtual meeting format, I am asking your patience as our team work quickly to possibly re recognize and unmute uh, members and guests. Bella. Thank you, Chairman. Um, our first question today uh, comes from Claire Lucas. Um, feel free to uh, unmute your microphone um, and we will uh, feel free to ask your question and the floor is yours. Great, thank you um, so much for recognizing me. So this is um, for Chair Biafor. I understand that there were contested elections for other positions held the same day. I think the positions um, that were contested were the Associate um, Secretary position and also the Parliamentarian. I'm assuming that the same process was followed for those elections. So I was wondering if anyone filed a grievance or raised issue with those elections. If the process was flawed for the four, are the other elections flawed? Were they also flawed? Um, 
thank you, Claire. There was also a vice chair position. There were three that were contested. And um, no, they were given proper notice. No one um, after the fact contested anything or, um, you know, asked any questions. They accepted the vote of the committee and that's the last we heard and we moved on. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, we have a hand raised from uh, Brian Wabi. So we will uh, unmute your microphone and uh, the floor is yours to present your question. <laughs> I think that works. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, we've heard today and seen in the press around this that the challenger uh, um, alleges that the West Virginia Democratic Party has never had an, uh, an affirmative action plan and therefore has been in violation of the DNC charter and bylaws for the last 40 years. Is this accurate? And, and who does this question go to? What? Was, uh, what? Okay. The question was to the chairman. Um, refer it to Daughtry and Lee, Leon, to, to Frank and Leon. To. Okay. Uh, Brian, I, you know, I would like to refer that question to Reverend uh, Leah Daughtry, who is more familiar with the last 40 years, not that she's been around for 40 years, but <laughs> she's got the experience. So Reverend Daughtry, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wabi, for your question. And I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge my own chair, Mr. Jacobs. It is good to be with you. And uh, I'm here with my colleague, uh, Frank Leon. And as you've heard from the, in the MOU, uh, we were both tasked uh, as members of the Rules and Bylaws Committee to uh, be the ones to help uh, implement the MOU with Ms. Vickers and Chair Beafort. So we have spent the last uh, six or eight months working on this particular uh, implementation of the MOU. To answer your question, it's really two parts. One, our charter uh, in Section 8 does talk about uh, uh, state parties and the national party being uh, directed to adopt and implement affirmative action programs to ensure diversity as practical, as nearly as practicable uh, based on democratic electorate in the state. Um, the, the hinge here is on the word adopt because our practice has been that we allow state parties to implement affirmative action programs in the manner that they see fit. We do not require any state party to do this any kind of particular way. So among our 57 state parties, some have a formal adoption process where they take it to the executive committee and there's a vote. In some parties, they don't do that. In some parties, it is a function of the CEO or the executive director or the chair. In some parties, they hire an outreach director whose job that is, and there isn't really a written plan uh, laid out. We have given uh, a great deal of latitude and leeway to state parties and state party chairs and executives to implement affirmative action uh, uh, provisions in the way that works for their state party. And we know that every state party is different how we do things in New York is very different from how Chairman Curry does them in New Jersey and what, what would happen in Nebraska or Maine or Vermont or my adopted home state of West Virginia. And so we intentionally allow state parties to uh, implement affirmative action to the, in the way that works for their state. We do not require and we do not monitor these individual state party plans as it relates to affirmative action. The only thing that we monitor, and Chair Beafort referenced this just a little bit ago, 
The only thing that we closely monitor is the affirmative action plans that every state must submit as part of their delegate selection plans. This dates back, Chairman Curry, it even predates me. That's it right. dates back to the 1976 convention uh, as a result of the Mikulski Commission. Mm -hmm. And every state party must submit affirmative action plans with goals as part of their delegate selection plan. And those of you who track this know that we go through every single state party's plan to ensure that they are meeting the goals and that they are compliant before we can approve their plan and then send them on to the convention. Important to note, we do not set quotas. Our charter does not permit the setting of quotas. We establish broad goals based on the performance of the Democratic electorate, and the state party sends that as a goal, and they work to achieve those goals. Sometimes they meet them, sometimes they exceed them, and sometimes they have more work to do. So that's the, the broad rush of the answer. I'm sure Frank, who is my new favorite lawyer, may have some additional points to make. I told Frank yesterday, he's going to be who I called. And when I go to Georgia to get arrested for handing out food and water, I'm taking Frank with me. Uh, get me out of jail. Yeah, I may, I may be there in jail with you. Um, uh, yeah, actually, uh, Bishop Carter really, really covered uh, the, the, the situation in terms of what is required uh, of affirmative action plans of states. Um, the, the issue here is um, number one, did the state sufficiently comply with, with those guidelines? And, and it's clear that they did, I think. And then secondly, if, even if it had not, uh, didn't comply, how would that have affected the results? And we're talking about overturning uh, unanimous elections. And, and you can't really base that on, on speculation. And that's, that's all you have. Um, it's not directly relevant to the challenge itself. But as, as Bishop Tartary mentioned, we, we spent a lot of time with West Virginia uh, adopting new affirmative action uh, standards and specific plans. And, and that effort is a continuing one. Um, there have been some, some rockiness in it, but that's going to be, it has to be uh, affirmative action and outreach is always an, an ongoing process. And, um, and West Virginia seems to be is pointed in the right direction in, in that regard. Um, so I, I, I agree. The statement that West Virginia has never had affirmative action for 47 years and was required to, and it's been in violation of the DNC charter, is, is not an accurate uh, account of, of the circumstances. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you all. Uh, the next question we have from uh, Michael Kapp. Uh, we will ask to unmute your microphone. And uh, once you can, uh, feel free to present your question. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, first, Mr. Chair, I'd like to address a quick question to staff or the parliamentarian. Would that be OK? Uh, yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, to follow up on a previous question about why the other non-DNC member officers were or are being challenged here, uh, it's my understanding that uh, challengers can only bring um, uh, challenges uh, to DNC members. Is that uh, potentially why those other three seats were not challenged here? I will get your answer from uh, a parliamentarian. Yes, sir, that's correct. This body only has jurisdiction to hear challenges to the credentials of DNC members. Thank you so much. And then, Mr. Chair, I have one question for each of the parties. Is that okay? Uh, yes, go right ahead. Which one do you want to start with? Uh, I'll start with uh, the, the chairwoman. Uh, chairwoman, we, we heard a lot about the 30,000 uh, emails being sent to provide notice of this meeting, but I didn't see any digital report of that email being sent. In my day job, I'm a communications professional. I've also run digital campaigns for a lot of different Democratic candidates and party organizations. No matter what email distribution program used by the West Virginia Democratic Party, all of these programs make it easy to produce a report that details exactly how many emails were sent, how many were received, what the open rate was, how many clicks uh, the links in the email um, were made, et cetera. Um, producing this report would definitely help bolster your argument. I apologize if I missed it in the documents that committee members received, 
but is your team able to provide this report to us? It is, it is my understanding that, that we could. Um, those emails that went out to the various groups, um, you know, we, we met our burden of the bylaws and we went above and beyond to do that, um, you know, by sending the paid notice and, and, and doing the other releases, posting it on the website and those sorts of things. And then we did send out to fundraising groups, to county chairs, asking them all to share. As a matter of fact, Ms. Vickers did a, a Facebook Live inviting folks to, to be on there. So we felt we did adequate, adequate uh, re outreach to those folks, to our email lists. And um, I, I'm not sure, I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Michael. Um, next, I'd like to ask Ms. Vickers a question. Go right ahead, uh, Michael. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Vickers, one of my biggest issues with this challenge is that none of the DNC seats were contested. Um, but as has been pointed out, the other non-DNC seats were. Uh, may I ask, why didn't you or other challengers run for those DNC seats? Oh, that is a great question. Thank you very much. Um, the, if you could imagine in your own state what it would take to run for a state party chair, a uh, first vice chair, DNC committee man and woman, and those are incredibly high ranking positions in the party. If no one knows about those meetings and you only find out about it with five days notice, I mean, would, would any of you all run for, for chair of the party for these high ranking positions if you only had five days notice? I mean, it is, it is incomprehensible to think that anybody would even have a chance at that. I found out about the elections five days before, and that's because a friend of mine was on the executive committee and, and forwarded me the, the email. Um, I contacted people that I thought would be appropriate and would be interested in running for some of the positions that we thought we might have a chance at. But even then, even then, five days notice to contact almost, I think that it was ballpark 100, a little bit less than 100 people to contact them, have a conversation with them. Uh, you know, it, it, that is difficult to do. If you are going to give people a fair opportunity, which is what the bylaws say, that everybody has a full right to full participation in all party affairs and all party affairs includes the opportunity to run for party positions. How in the world could you do that with five days notice? And I also want to point out that the offices weren't even listed. I mean, nobody even knew. It just said um, election of officers. No one knew who those were. And I want to be really, really clear that nowhere in no document anywhere that was sent out by the party were the DNC committee man and woman. I mean, somebody might make an argument. Well, officers, you know it was the chair and the vice chair. But DNC committee men and women are not officers. They are not listed in the bylaws as officers and they're a completely separate section. There was zero, zero notice that those positions would be there. So I think if you are going to have a people in a cave, and they get together to have their elections and they stick their head out the cave and, and say, hey, we're having some elections in here. Oh, no. All right. There, nobody responded. I mean, if people do not know about an election and given fair opportunity to do so, how could they possibly run? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Chair, I do have a quick comment that I want to make, but I want to make sure that we have time for other questions. So I'll hold that comment for later. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, the next question uh, comes from Bell Young Hong. Uh, we will ask to unmute you and feel free to ask your question uh, once you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a couple of questions um, and they're kind of all related. Um, so first I'd like to ask, uh, 
Chairwoman uh, uh, Belinda uh, Barfour, um, how many people were there actually uh, at the election? And kind of correlated to that is that the normal number of people that would show up at an election, whether virtual or in person. Um, um, go thank ahead. you. I'm sorry. Thank you, Bill. Um, we had um, a, an unusual quorum that day. I mean, we had a very good quorum. Um, in addition to that, we had um, probably a few hundred on that call simply because they could get on the call. They didn't have to travel. So it was probably participated in more so by being virtual than if we'd actually had it in the middle of the state and asked people to come. Usually on those type of meetings, we may get 100 people. We definitely had many, much, much, much more. And it's something that we do every four years. So if you're in tune with the party and watching what's happening, our bylaws are very specific that this is a four-year uh, election, happens every four years, and it and it um, spells out in the bylaws, you know, exactly what positions there are. So, so if you are a party regular, um, you would know that um, the election would happen every four years, number one. Number right. two, that um, if you want to be running candidates um, against um, uh, any in, in, in for any of the um, of the positions, they would have been recruited way before the date, or five days, or ten days before the election. Um, so I guess that question, if I may ask uh, Ms. Vickers. Um, uh, since you have been mounting challenges uh, to the um, to the chair and to you know the the officers on a number of things uh, concerning the party and concerning the um, uh, concerning the um, um, essentially the suitability of the can of the of the officers, um, did you have enough time to recruit candidates? Like you know, from the time that you started mounting. The challenges, I mean, not 10 days or five days before, because all of us know that you don't do that, right, uh, to to, uh, to recruit a candidate just to run five days before. So uh, I guess, you know, I'm just curious whether you have, uh, you have done any uh, recruiting if you didn't, you know, if you weren't running yourself. Thank you for the question. Yes, uh, we had, hold on just a second. We had one uh, person in particular that I want to um, at, tell you about. We had a young woman um, who identifies as youth, and she um, also identifies as Native American, although I do not know if that is from the registered, you know, how that works. I do not know that. But uh, she is a, a certified parliamentarian, and we had been, and, and we also have a young man who uh, is a friend of hers, and that's sort of like their thing. They enjoy, really, really enjoy that. And it was our hope to have uh, one of those uh, and for a while because there are so many uh, parliamentary uh, disasters within uh, meetings. And so we had known for a long time that we wanted uh, them to run. And so, uh, so one of those did run, and um, so a a, a diverse a certified parliamentarian uh, did not win in this uh, election against someone who um, did not have, and, and she was, a, I'm sure, a fine person, but she did not have any parliamentary uh, expertise. So that was one in particular. Um, we have known for a long time that it's going to take a while when we are. Uh, we are running people when we have an opportunity. Uh, just recently, uh, we, uh, because now the bylaws allow for 30 days notice of meetings, uh, there were some vacancies. There were four vacancies on the committee. Uh, of those four, uh, we ran people in three of those and we won two of those. So yes, we are doing uh, what we think is right. Uh, and we feel that the bylaws that we um, helped uh, put in place um, along with, you know, the DNC and Chair Beaufort, uh, that that gives us some infrastructure so that we can do the things that you're suggesting. But none of that is, well, but again, back on June 29th, 2020, those, the bylaws were very different back then. The diversity of the committee was different back then. And there was just not that fair opportunity. 
Um, so that's, I hope that answers the question. Thank you for, for it. It does. And actually, you know, it's very commendable what you're doing because that's essentially the party building that we need to do. Um, the issue at hand, though, uh, and and I've been listening, Mr. Chairman, I've been listening very intently uh, to the arguments presented by both the challenger and the challenged um, uh, individuals. Um, I am having, I, I have to confess, I'm a little bit um, still scratching my head uh, because the, the issue, um, uh, you know, if we, we cut it to the chase, it is like there's a group of people that is not happy with the results of an election um, and they want to challenge it. Um, and that's all good and fine. But it seems to me that there are organs within the West Virginia Democratic Party that allows that to happen. I think that is your Board of Appeal, and I understand that that was filed um, and that uh, the Board of Appeal denied the challenge and you appealed that uh, thing. So it seems to me that there are, there are remedies within your own party that still has to work its course. I am having a little bit difficulty um, wrapping my wrapping my head around this issue, Mr. Chairman, because I am not sure that the DNC, our specifically our credentials committee, is in the business of trying to overturn a duly elected slate of officers. If that happened, I think that would create a precedence for all fifty-seven. Uh, states and territories uh, in this union of ours. Um, and so um, I don't know if this is the time for me to make the comment, but like Michael, I'm going to reserve my comment till a little bit later. Um, I have I have a fundamental concern with this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you, Bill. Always good to see you, my dear. Uh, were there any more questions? So I believe there's time for uh, one more question uh, from Jay Jacobs. Uh, we will ask to unmute you, uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Chair Curry. Good to see you. Good to see you, Chairman. Thank you. I, I have a, a couple of short questions, if you don't mind. The last one for you, Chair Curry. Um, but first, uh, for Chair Beerfor, I, I understood in your testimony that you said that the notice period was uh, by your bylaws was five days, but you had sent out those emails and had the other notice nine days. Am I, am I correct in that? That they had nine days. That is correct. That is correct. I wanted to clarify that. I also wanted to ask you a question about um, those, um, uh, those elected um, officials, uh, the elected party officials who were not challenged, but were in contested races. Is there a process in the, in your state party for those seats to have been challenged if someone wanted to challenge them? Absolutely. As, as it showed in the meeting, there was a member who nominated folks for those positions. And as a matter of fact, the parliamentarian that they were uh, contesting is a black attorney, uh, female, who is, is very aware of parliamentary procedure. So, you know, on one hand, they were talking about diversity. On the other hand, they were challenging this black woman who, you know, won the election through the committee. But to answer your question, absolutely. So there's a process, but no one actually did, in fact, challenge those people. They did not. Okay. I, I need to know that. And also, next, next, uh, this, I think you might have answered, but I just want to have clarity. That, that MOU that we've been hearing about that you entered into, did the state party uh, comply with that? We did. We did. January 4th, we made our final compliance and sent it in and um, are very grateful for the help that we received from the RBC and others, you know, to move this thing forward and to help West Virginia get back on the Democratic track again. Thank you. And Chairman Curry, if you could answer, I, you may need, uh, I don't know who would know this, but in recent, uh, in recent years, has there been a circumstance where the DNC's credentials committee has voted to reject the credentials of a unanimously elected um, DNC member who ran in an uncontested race. Is there any recent history of us having done that? Chairman, not in my eight or nine years. I might want to refer this to Reverend Daughtry, 
who's been around for a few days, uh, if she would like to take that one on. My colleague, yes, from New York. Hello, Mr. Chairman. Uh, not to my knowledge, I've been hanging around the party since the days of Ron Brown. I don't recall mm -hmm. um, uh, an uncontested election being overturned. Um, uh, you know, Patrice and Rick Boylan can correct me because uh, Rick Boylan was there when I got there. So he right. may know more than me, but I do not recall that. Uh, both of my chairmen, no. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Yes, we have one last question uh, from uh, Isabel Framer. Uh, feel free, we'll unmute you uh, and the floor is yours. Mr. Chair, uh, mine is not really a question, but I just wanted to make a comment. Is this an appropriate time? Uh, I would hold them to the end if you don't mind. Okay, thank you. I think I just... Okay, pursuing the rules, we might have a few minutes left of 30 minutes for debate. Our questions have now concluded. I want to thank all our members for their thoughtfulness of the questions and comments. At this time, the chair will recognize Rick Way to make a motion to propose or offer a resolution to dispose of the pending challenge. Rick? Rick, are you muted? Uh, am I okay? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to pr provide the following resolution of the Credentials Committee for consideration. Uh, this resolution uh, of the C Credentials Committee of the Democratic National Committee. In the challenge of Selena Vickers and seven other West Virginia Democrats challengers to the credentialing of Belinda Beaufort, chair of the West Virginia Democratic Party, state party, and as such, a member of the Democratic National Committee, DNC, Rod Snyder, first vice chair of the state party, and as such, a member of the DNC, DNC committee woman, Elaine Harris, and DNC committeeman, Patrick Maroney, challenge parties before the credentials committee of the DNC that the committee resolves as follows. Whereas the state party, held of officer elections by virtual meeting on June 29, 2020. And whereas the challenge parties were elected by unanimous affirmation in their respective elections. And whereas each of the challenge parties elections were uncontested. And whereas no West Virginia Democrat has indicated that they were interested in running in the elections, but were otherwise prevented from doing so. And whereas Selena Vickers, as a representative of challenges, challengers in prior challenges against the state party, its convention delegates, and the challenge parties agreed to withdraw the prior challenges in a July 26, 2020 memorandum of understanding with the state party and co-chairs of the Rules and Bylaws Committee. And whereas, as inducement for the withdrawal of the prior challenges, the state party agreed to conduct a comprehensive review of its bylaws under RBC supervision to address many of the issues raised in the challenges, whereas the state party conducted a comprehensive review of its bylaws and adopted multiple amendments to increase openness, transparency, and diversity, which were all approved by the RBC. And whereas the challenges, challengers filed this challenge on July 28, 2020, two days after executing the MOU, alleging that certain aspects of the elections violated the DNC charter and bylaws, where the challenge makes identical allegations and substantially similar claims to a challenge withdrawn pursuant to the July 26, 2020 MOU. And whereas the committee held a hearing on June 15, 2021, as which the challengers and challenge parties 
had an opportunity to present evidence and argument on the challenges for claim. Now, therefore, based on the record and proceedings before it, which indicate that one, the state party's executive committee was equally divided at the time of the elections. Two, the state party provided notice of the elections to its executive committee and to the public. Three, the state party had an affirmative action program at the time of the elections and has worked to improve and fortify that program in the interim. And four, had the composition of the state party's executive committee been different, the challenged parties would still have won their respective elections. The committee hereby resolves that the challenge be denied and the Belinda before Rod Snyder, Elaine Harris, and Patrick Maroney be credentialed as members of the DNC. The committee further resolves that the challenged parties should continue their efforts to strengthen and diversify the state party in accordance with the DNC charter and bylaws. So resolved and so ordered this 15th day of June 2021. I present this resolution, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I just want to point out, if you didn't say the resolution is uh, on your screen, uh, at this time, first of all, uh, Mr. Wade, uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, I would like a, uh, is there a session? Uh, I'd like to second, second this it. Resolution? I'd like to second it, um, Chairman Curry. Okay, would you state your name, please? Claire Lucas. Okay, any questions? Okay, the resolution have been moved and second uh, uh, at, for the challenge for the four members of the West Virginia uh, party. According to our rules, the proposed resolution will be discussed for approximately 20 minutes, 10 for each side, with equal time divided uh, for the opportunity of the resolution. At this time, we will now open the floor for 20 minutes for discussion of the credentials committee members. If any member would like to be recognized, please use the raised hand on your Zoom and that will help us with the staff assist you in the queue. When uh, you're, on, you're speaking, you will then be unmuted. A member is recognized, they will be able to identify whether they are in favor or against the resolution. Remarks for any against the resolution will be tracked separately to comply with our rules. We will do our best to call on everyone who has asked to speak. All right, we'll start the time. Yes, it seems we have a hand raised from uh, Bell Yong Hong. Um, feel free, to, we will unmute your mic and feel free to ask your question. Uh, you have the floor. I actually do not have a question. I do have a comment. Um, and, and my comment is that I support the resolution. I think that my rationale for supporting it is that uh, all, of the, all of the arguments that were presented uh, by both the challenger and the challenged um, uh, points to the fact that um, this is the correct course of action. That if we were to accept the challenger, that it would cause an unprecedented, an, a precedent setting um, uh, action by the DNC to overturn a unanimous uh, election, uh, uncontested e uh, unanimous election, and it would set a precedent uh, for the rest of the 57 um, uh, states and territories. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Next up, we have uh, Michael Kapp. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I'm disappointed in what I've heard here today. I don't believe that the West Virginia Democratic Party has been nearly as transparent or open as they probably should have been but I'm glad to hear that some steps have been taken to ensure that the West Virginia Democratic Party is as accessible as possible. I encourage that these diversity and inclusivity uh, efforts to continue um, in a collaborative and welcoming manner. It's also my hope that the West Virginia Democratic Party doesn't take uh, this motion and this dismissal of this challenge to mean that the notice for this election 
or that their contemporaneous affirmative action plan was somehow ratified or approved by the DNC. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, I, I believe you have a special responsibility. And I think you, you know that uh, to bridge these gaps that we've seen here before us today. And I hope you'll focus on building up the next generation of West Virginia Democratic Party members, a generation of activists that should be as inclusive and representative of West Virginia Democrats as much as possible. I know that there's a lot of hard feelings here today, um, but please continue to work with the challengers here today so we can continue to work together and create a better and stronger West Virginia Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Michael, Michael. Thank you all. Um, up next, uh, Minnie Ortiz, uh, we will unmute you and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. My, my comments are, I'm, I like uh, Belle, um, I'll share her view. Um, this committee um, uh, is uh, jurisdiction is to uh, determine whether the elections and the procedures were proper. I too, um, as some of my colleagues, I'm concerned with some of the allegations um, of lack of inclusivity and uh, and the like. Um, I, I think we're all for that. We're all Democrats. Um, as, as so the the only thing I'll say is um, uh, I will vote uh, for the resolution, and I hope, um, as some have suggested, that the uh, the chairwoman continues to work hard to make the party uh, look like America. So thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Ortiz, just, uh, if I hear you correctly, you're voting in favor of the resolution. Correct. I'm, I'm supporting uh, the unanimously elected uh, uh, members. Right. I, I just want to be sure. Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My pleasure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. There are no more hands raised. If there are no my hand raised, I guess time has expired. Uh, been before the members, the chair, now we'll call a roll, a vote on a resolution to dispose of the pending challenge. Members of the resolution, resolution uh, oh my God, committee, <laughs> sorry about that, guys, uh, it's long, uh, <laughs> denied the challenge. Uh, signal of the four members from West Virginia. A vote in favor of the resolutions uh, means you are voting to reject the challenge and accept the credentials of the DNC members from West Virginia. A vote against the resolution means you are voting to accept the challenge and to redeem the proposed, which includes rejecting credentials of the DNC members from West Virginia, requiring the state party to hold new elections. I now ask uh, Patrice Teller to do the roll call. Please, uh, if you're voting in favor, say yay. If you oppose, please say no. Uh, please, if you're holding a proxy, please vote. Uh, uh, properly for the proxy. Patrice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll start with Mr. Bolin. I want to vote in favor of the resolution and I'm voting a proxy for Mr. Fry on this committee. And uh, I support the resolution uh, on his behalf as well. So, is that clear? Yes, thank you. We have you down for uh, in favor of the resolution and Mr. Fry in favor of the resolution. Thank you. Ms. Estrada has given her proxy to you, Mr. Curry. I vote in favor of the resolution as well. Thank you. Ms. Framer. Yay. Thank you. Mr. Heredia. Thank you. Mr. Jacobs? Uh, yay. Thank you. Mr. Cap? Aye. Ms. Leon Hong? In favor of the resolution. Thank you. Ms. Lucas?
In favor of the resolution. Thank you. Mr. Martinez. I'm voting yes in favor to the resolution. Thank you. Ms. Velasco. In favor of the resolution. Thank you. Mr. Ortiz. I vote yay in favor of the resolution. Ms. Pinsky. In favor of the resolution. Mr. Wade. Yes, Mr. Wade, I vote favor in favor of the resolution and I hold a proxy for Mr. Brian Wabi as well. Thank you. And Ms. Ward, who was with us earlier, I don't see that she's on. Uh, she has given her proxy to um, Mr. Martinez. Mr. Martinez, how do you vote the proxy? I'm voting yes also for the resolution. Great, thank you. Mr. Chairman, you have 16 members voting in favor of the resolution. Uh, thank you, uh, Patrice. Uh, this uh, wraps up uh, uh, for our adjournment. Members, uh, you I thank you so much for the job you've done today. I thank all of you that are on Zoom call for the time and thought for deliberation on this matter. When this committee meets, we often must deal with difficult issues. But please know that your commitment to this process and our party is truly appreciated. We will not be where we are without all of you. You know that. At this time, uh, we are working through two other challenges before this committee, one from Puerto Rico and one from Florida. Uh, we do not yet have another meeting schedule, but we will let you know if this committee will meet uh, or will need to meet before our next DNC uh, meeting. Please stay healthy. And if you have not done so, get your vaccine. That is so important. Uh, folks, on Thursday, uh, it will be my final day as state chair of the New Jersey Democratic Party. I have to tell you, we've grown uh, tremendously over the last eight years. We now have over one million more registered Democrats here in New Jersey uh, than uh, Republicans, and we're all proud of that and that hard work. But uh, that means that I, my term will then uh, in as a member of the DNC. Uh, it's very, very possible that I uh, will see you in a different capacity, but I just want to first of all thank our DNC staff uh, for the work that they do and the friendships that I have made over the last eight plus years with so many of you. I want to thank uh, especially Miss Helen for coming to New Jersey today and I don't know what I would do without my present exactly uh, executive director here in New Jersey, and that's uh, Sally Avellino. Uh, thank you for your work. At this time, I went into, if there's no more business, uh, no other comments. Just one, I, second. one second. I think I want to call someone. Okay. And we also need for the record to actually reflect the no vote, which was zero. <laughs> so just state for the record. Okay. Vote. Folks, I would just like to add uh, for the record, there were no votes, zero votes uh, for the resolution. Just 16-4. 16 zero was the vote. Uh, just 16 for no against. So with that, if there are no other comments, I will entertain a motion for adjournment. Move to adjourn. Second. Bell. 
Any questions? Thank you so much for your service committee. It's been a pleasure working with you uh, over the last few years and uh, hope to see you soon. Uh, God bless the meeting is adjourned. Without a Thank you, Mr.